When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. Welcome to Important Not Important. My name is Quinn Emmett. And my name is Brian Colbert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And this is science for people who give a shit. That's right. Uh, We give you the tools you need to fight for a better future for yourself, for your family, Uh, For everyone, folks, in this podcast, we give you the context straight from the smartest people on earth, uh, just such incredible guests, and then we build to the action steps you can take to support them. That's right. And our guests have been scientists, fashionistas, nurses, fashionistas, Uh journalists, Uh uh, authors, educators, politicians, farmers, astronauts. It just doesn't doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. We had a reverend once. We had a reverend. That's right. Uh, This is your friendly reminder. You can send questions, thoughts, feedback, really anything to us on Twitter at importantnotimp. Or you can email us at questions at importantnotimportant.com. Folks, you can also join tens of thousands of other smart people. If you feel like you're behind on the science news, you want to just be able to keep up with it pretty quickly, guess what? You can subscribe uh, at importantnotimportant.com. You can read it in 10 minutes or less, or Brian will read it to you in 10 minutes or less, right in the podcast feed. Super sure easy. will. Yep. Tell them what we're talking uh, about, Brian. This week's episode is mm-hmm. a fashion revolution. That's right. You're to learn how to buy clothes that last, mm-hmm. uh, that don't ruin the oceans or your hormones. Great. And don't exploit low-income workers. It's a win-win. It's a, it's a win, 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 win. Uh, win this win, was win. super awesome. Our guest, oh man, I loved her so much. Ursula de Castro. She is a fashion icon. She's been around forever. She started Fashion Revolution. Just a supremely awesome uh, organization that's working globally, but also in 92 countries around the world uh, to, to work on all those things we just mentioned. And you can join up with them and their big week is coming up. We're going to talk all about it right here. Everyone can take part. Everyone should take part because everybody wears clothes. Should we uh, get into it, Brian? It was such a great conversation. Let's just go. Let's go. Our guest today is Ursula de Castro. And together we're going to ask, where do your clothes go when you wash them? I know that seems crazy, but we'll get to it. Ursula, welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank Um, you for asking me. If we, uh, we could get started just by, could you, could you let everybody listening uh, know um, who you are uh, and a brief uh, what you do? Okay. So my name is Ursula de Castro and I'm the co-founder and global creative director of an organization called Fashion Revolution, which is at this point in time, the biggest or one of the biggest fashion activism movement in the world. We have a presence in over 90 countries worldwide. We were born, founded by myself and Carrie Summers as a result of the Rana Plaza disaster in 2013. And so this will be our eighth year of campaigning. And every year we do this Fashion Revolution Week, which is really galvanizing support and raising awareness as well as um, remembering the Rana Plaza disaster, which was the worst industrial disaster in the fashion industry and killed 1,138 people. Um, We're probably better known for our hashtag, who made my clothes, which has been used millions of times. And by its sister hashtag, the response, I made your clothes, which provided so much visibility to supply chain workers and garment workers worldwide. And um, before Fashion Revolution, I started as um, I had a brand, an upcycling brand, um, small niche, but quite popular. 
That was in the end of the 90s. It started, I was also the co-founder and co-curator of Aesthetica, the British Fashion Council Sustainable Fashion Area at London Fashion Week. In between 2006 and 2014, I am a mentor. I lecture at universities and work with young emerging brands. And I'm now an author. I just published my first book, which is called Loved Clothes Last and was published by Penguin Life. Congratulations. Amazing. Very exciting. Well, it sounds like yeah. Yeah, you've been <laughs> slacking off and haven't done too much. Um, uh, so. Right. I also forgot to say that I am the mother of four and grandmother of two. Oh, wonderful. That's that's fantastic. Now, can I send you my children as well? Is that an option? <laughs> no, I'm nearly done. I'm, my youngest is, yep, my youngest is 18. I'm oh, over. my gosh. Mommy is leaving home. Because I'm two and a half days into spring break and ready to just put them in a FedEx box and <laughs> send them right away. They're wonderful, but oh, my Lord. Yeah. They really awesome. are wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. That was, uh, yeah, wow. Quite, quite an intro. Reminder to everyone here uh, uh, that our goal is to provide some context uh, for our topic today, our very important topic today, uh, and our questions today. Uh, and then we'll get into some action-oriented questions uh, and, and, and action steps uh, that everybody can uh, ask and take uh, uh, to, to help support you and learn more about what's going on, okay? Awesome. Let's do this thing. Uh, so Ursula, we do like to start with one important question to set the tone for uh, this fiasco. Instead of going through your entire uh, life story, uh, we do like to ask, why are you vital to the survival of the species? Well, every person is vital to the survival of the species. You know, the extinction of anything from an ecosystem will make it weaker in many ways. And what I'm doing is that my work is to try and explain this to as many people as possible, that we live in a profoundly unequal society and this is having effects on our environment. And I chose to use clothes as the medium by which I can practice my skills and um, share my opinions, because also I believe that, you know, clothes affecting 100% of the population, the huge impact that this industry has on people and nature so I do well with clothes. I was a designer. I understand them. I know the industry. I'm in the industry. I'm an insider as well as an outsider. And so I chose to use this to help make things better for us. I, I, I think that's so wonderful. And, and is I got so excited about this conversation because we have, you know, we don't just cover climate or clean water or COVID or whatever it might be, there's all these big systemic issues that are out there, and some of them are very tough, and some of them could be wonderful, you know, uh, curing uh, pediatric cancer, whatever it might be. But we get this question a lot, and sometimes there's some desperation behind it or, or someone feeling very lost, which is, what can I do? And th the best response I've come up with to, to start my side of the conversation is, what can you do? And what can you bring to the table? And what, what do you do for your job? Who, who do you feel like you are? What skills do you have? What, do you, what interested you in seventh grade science or whatever it might be? And, and because these problems are so complicated and so immediate, we need everyone and we need all of those skills. And we need someone like yourself who has been such a part of this industry for so long is the perfect person to also turn around and take it on and be so transparent about it. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to, to get into that today. So thank you for sharing that. You know, I'm in total agreement with you because when people say to me, what do I do? You know, how can I make change? Um, and I make this point very strongly in my book. It is from yourself, the only place where you can start. And it has to follow your instinct and it has to follow your interests. This is not about juicing or a really quick diet. This is about making really effective common sense to a certain extent, changes to your life. And there are so many ways that you can interact. And obviously, I, I choose to explain how we can interact, starting with clothes. But it has to match sure. your gut feeling. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you for, for sharing that. I'm, I'm really excited to get into it here. Um, because as you said, everybody wears clothing in some way. Um, okay, I just want to add a little context for today's uh, question before we really get into it. And today we're going to talk about 
of, of course, the people who are making our clothes and also what happens once we have those clothes and as they're made and where they go and, and all of that. So to touch on the latter, um, and we, we've we've started to t- have more conversations about the plastic side of things with some folks who are working on the science side. But just to reiterate for everyone, we produced, and, and Ursula, please also correct me if I'm wrong, since you are clearly the expert on all of this now, but this is what I've managed to, to wrangle. We produced about 9 billion tons of plastic from 1950 to 2015, uh, and 50% of that was produced in the last 18 years alone. Uh, 99, 99% of, of plastic, uh, whether it's uh, Tupperware or Legos or things in your clothes, whatever it might be, or car pieces, they're made from oil and gas. Um, we've all been locked at home in some variation. We've seen the Instagram ads. We we all love our new comfortable sweatpants. But every part of the plastic supply chain, from the extraction of raw materials, uh, the production, the distribution, the washing, the disposal, uh, human health, uh, and not to mention marine and land ecosystems, is threatened. Half of all textiles created include plastic. Polyester is 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 double the volume of cotton at this point. Um, less than one percent of clothing was recycled into new clothing as of I think two that through two thousand seventeen, and again, kind of where these things intersect the the scientific side and and, and the people side because you can't extract one from the other. So many, especially, I mean, here in America, so many of the extraction and production facilities are on indigenous land uh, here and across the world. And the air pollution from those uh, refineries most directly affects communities of color. You know, there's the statistic in the U.S. that 60% of of black Americans live within 30 miles of some form of fossil fuel facility. And the production facilities are in these communities too, right? We've got Cancer Alley in the United States, which is notoriously toxic. Cancer's through the roof. And this is all before we get to the the offsets of, of the microplastics, right? Where you see... Um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but a, a fleece jacket sends about two grams of microfibers into the water every time it's washed. And then half of those make it in to the rivers and seas. And we have found these things in the deserts and mountaintops, in wells and drinking water pipes. They're not just, this isn't the old six packs choking turtles and dolphins, right? These are particles in our water and our bloodstreams are interfering with our hormones. But everyone has to wear clothes. Everyone wears clothes. They are uh, they're in the most comfortable things we wear, uh, the most fashionable things we wear. They're marketed everywhere. Anything that stretches is made from elastic, which is made from virgin oil. Anyways, all that is before we even come to terms with who's making our clothes. So these are the. this is sort of the ground I would like to cover today. And I, I, I'm so excited to have you, someone who, who understands this so well, come to it. So we'll get to the answer to where do your clothes go when you wash them here soon, folks. But I want to talk first about your Who Made My Clothes campaign, Ursula. We're always talking about these big fundamental problems, right? Climate change, public health, whatever they may be. But I, I'm, I'm so hyper-focused on when, whenever we're trying to break these things down, getting down to the, the, the fundamental pieces. They call them first principles sometimes, right? Um, and, and for me, all of these keep coming back to, because this is what people are being deprived of, is clean air, clean and affordable water, healthy and affordable food, and reliable and affordable shelter. If people are not getting those, those are the most fundamental issues of your problem. And so we have to start there. And so you have to ask, why are those not being guaranteed? And so when we're talking about who makes our clothes, I would love if you could talk a little bit about what you've discovered along the way and why you started with the workers as opposed to, you know, the waste and the outputs and the plastics. Well, we started with the workers because of directly from Rana Plaza. I mean, what Rana Plaza showed us was that this industry was beyond opaque. It was impenetrable. When Rana Plaza collapsed, despite, you know, together with the story of, you know, how harrowing it was, the workers not putting, you know, they they could see the cracks, they were not allowed to leave. I mean, you know, they were first evacuated and brought back in. I mean, it was a disaster. But the reality was that there were CEOs and CFOs all over the world ringing each other up saying, were we producing there? It was activists on the ground that were actually finding evidence as to which brands were producing in the Rana Plaza complex. And, you know, this lengthened the process of um, research, of of refunds, of the, the, you know, it, it really created a huge stumbling block 
and it evidenced that this industry very deliberately designed itself to exploit and designed itself to do so secretly in a, in a, in deliberately opaque supply chains. So fashion revolution to start with, we've always been about transparency. We publish our annual fashion transparency index in which we look at the public disclosure, because this is what transparency is, public disclosure available and comparable um, of major 250 brands in the world. And, you know, the, the, the plight of the workers is at the end of the day, we've seen it again. You know, we're in the middle of the pandemic and another mega crisis and we're seeing, you know, online magnates making billions and government workers and supply chain workers still being owed billions of dollars in unpaid wages. So it's easy to see, although it's been so difficult to see, but for us, it's been the journey to show this supply chain and to encourage brands to show the supply chain. And hopefully one day it will be mandatory. The industry will be regulated and all sorts of things that I know we will be talking about, such as, you know, transparency and understanding what's in our clothes as well as who makes them and in what conditions. These are things that are no longer potentials. Brands have an obligation to disclose this information because we as citizens and as their customers have absolutely every right to know. We do so with food. We do so with pharmaceutical, beauty, not with fashion. Yet we share many supply chains, say with food. This has also made so that the knowledge has been, you know, much knowledge has been lost in analyzing our clothes, understanding, asking ourselves questions. It was normal to want to know where something came from in the past because that often determined its quality. It's this removing of our industries in order to exploit other countries and other people that has really unraveled a, a, a very rich societal you know, industry. So could you give us a couple examples of uh, some of the countries that are most affected by um, the, 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 the consumption from the West over the past few years that you have most specifically tried to shine a light on? Well, you know, it kind of really did move from China, went on to Bangladesh, and then it started including Cambodia and Vietnam, Myanmar now. So it, it's a race to the bottom. It's a race, Sri Lanka as well. It's a race to the cheaper, to the cheaper price, to the least regulated factories. To you know, obviously there is now a push for transparency. And to be honest with you, some of the most incredible innovation we are actually finding right there where we have exploited the most, because obviously they see it every day. It's it's sure. part of their, you know. So there's some amazing things happening precisely in those countries where we also see the biggest shames. It seems like, you know, Brian, I think back to um, <clears throat> Ursula, we had a really wonderful conversation. Again, you know, we are two white men who have to wear clothing. I wouldn't say we're the most fashionable folks. I mean, I just wear T-shirts every day, much to my wife's chagrin. But, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to humble ourselves and be transparent about what we don't understand about the things that are affecting the world. And we had this wonderful conversation with um, the CEO of, a, of a, a cosmetics company, a beauty counter. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. Oh, yeah, Greg. Greg Renfrew. She she's fantastic, and you know she she is leading a sort of a similar charge for cosmetics. Um, and one of the things she revealed to us, which is just unreal, is that in the United States, cosmetics hadn't been regulated in any way since 1938. And just understanding, yeah. you know, in any way, both what's in it and where it is we are harvesting uh, the minerals that goes into these things and who is who is doing that harvesting and, and distribution and such and um similar i mean it's going on your right, face these things that are going on you know, your body uh, that you're well, using well i mean you know the skin is the second most absorbing organ in our body and some of the chemicals that are present in our clothes not only will continue to release well after the first few washes but in many incidents they're actually banned 
Um, you know, many uh, chemicals banned in the EU are not banned in the producing countries where potentially the fabric is first made. And so this lack of transparency, oh, wow. this lack of information, this is what I'm saying. We are being, um, you know, denied uh, a really big opportunity to speak with our clothes as much as we've had an opportunity to a certain extent to put that pressure when it came to food. And I look forward to the day that we will say, can you believe it? The fashion industry wasn't regulated until, uh, right. and I hope it's sure. next year. <laughs> For sure, yeah. I hope it's in two yeah. years from now. But the fashion industry is not regulated. It pollutes, it exploits. It's, you know, a, a kind of massive, massive industry that hides behind this. Fashion is frivolous. It's clothing mm -hmm. after all. You know, it hides behind this. And in fact, it's a massive, it has massive impact. <sighs> Yeah, uh, yeah. The uh, there, I think there was a the UN report this week um, that said plastic will be uh, twenty percent of of the world's oil consumption by by twenty fifty, and honestly, that seems uh, too low with everything that we know. You know, microplastics are are everywhere, but more importantly, and what I want to know more about from you is that you know they're they're built into what we're wearing, right? You just mentioned that. So how has fashion revolution? Uh, kept up with the pace of of science around microplastics, and and how are you guys, you know, pushing brands and, and designers to to do the same? Well, we we don't work with brands, so okay. the pushing that we do is your regular campaigning, the way that Fashion Revolution okay. does. So the way that we do it is that we provide the information. We are a giant network, and obviously we are also the strength. Um, our country coordinators worldwide who are often, you know, seeing the industry from their own country. And so we, we have a very global overview. And obviously, the, the, we, are, we have been talking about microplastics now since 2017. We started our uh, sort of entry into the, um, the concept of waste and the, and the environment to reach the environment via waste and via microplastic. And actually, our expert, uh, Carrie Summers, my, the other founder, is very much an expert on microplastics. She went on the expedition, um, which was a, a woman-led tour, um, you know, uh, not tour, but, you know, sailing across the globe to actually collect. Um, and she, she did a brilliant diary of that. It's um, at Carrie Summers um, in her Instagram. Really interesting. It was last year. She's very, very involved. Obviously, it's something that we talk about a lot within the context because it's you know we speak about sustainable materials we also speak about cotton what we also try and explain is that the care of our clothes is important and again it's it relates to a responsibility from brands to let us know what's in our clothes which launched this hashtag what's in our clothes precisely to talk about these issues, you know, from chemicals to microplastics. Because, again, without that vital information, we keep creating damage. Sure. So in the case of polyester, for instance, there are things that we can do from tomorrow morning. And it is to understand polyester sheds. Try to understand which polyester sheds more, like an acrylic polyester loose knitted jumper that will shed even as you walk. So those are, you know, unfortunately a mistake. They should never have been made, even if you buy them secondhand or, you know, you could use them decoratively, but you are cohabitating with that negative material. Like I'm sure there are plenty of others in our homes. Sure. But with, you know, you wouldn't buy a pair of, of polyester underpants because you'd have to wash them every day. You would buy a polyester coat. Maybe the lining of the polyester is that you can sponge clean or clean by the piece and not putting the whole thing through a cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, these are vital pieces of information that we need from brands to interact with the clothes that we've got in order to minimize our impact. You know, we can talk about the fashion supply chain and it always sounds like some faraway land where clothes are being made. We are in it. The minute we buy something, we enter that supply chain and are responsible for everything we buy. And it's a, about three phases, use, end of use and end of life. 
And at Fashion Revolution, we've really talked, and that's also then been the, the main subject of my book. We talk about longevity mm -hmm. as vital, mm -hmm. keeping, you know, in a throwaway society, what do you do? You keep and you mend and you repair and you swap and you share. You know, these are things that as communities, we can embrace immediately and stop the cycle. Speak loud and clear, you know, we want to keep. Sure. And that in itself is a, is a slowing down of a completely hysterical system. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, you know, it's, uh, sharks aren't generally a threat to people until you step into the water. But once you step into the water, you have to understand that you're in their, you're in their ball game now. And I, I loved how you said that you are, to, to paraphrase, cohabitating with, with polyester or whatever it might be. And, and I feel like that, you know, whether you're searching for mold in your home or, uh, you know, the, the lead pipes we've got in America that so many kids are drinking from or the air pollution that's coming in your door or the urban heat, whatever it might be, it's you're cohabitating with these things. It's in your schools and it's on your clothing. And like you said, the, whether it's whether it's uh, cosmetics or it's clothing, y your skin is so absorbent and, and we are just scratching the surface of what it can do to us to the point, like, you know, the, the reports on the microplastic is affecting hormones. I mean, you, you wouldn't yeah. think it would go that far from this jumper you buy, but here we are. Yeah, and we use them incredibly for all of our kind of, you know, sportswear. So we're sweating inside them as well. So we've got like level of absorptions of this stuff, which is, you know, doesn't bear thinking. Um, there are alternatives now. It's like, this is one of the things that one is trying to tackle and see, you know, again, going back to things that were potentially lost. I mean, merino wool is amazing for anything sportswear. It, you know, absorbs, but doesn't let sure. out your odor. It doesn't need to be washed off and it can be, you know, washed in a spot clean. So it's also informing ourselves on what else we can do. But definitely polyester, um, which also has the, the greatest um, gift in the sense because it can be continuously recycled. Obviously, not if it's blended with cotton, with clothes, and not if it's got a zip sure. and a button and a whatever, but as a wool fiber. But nevertheless, um, you know, it, it should, virgin polyester should be 100% banned, and recycled polyester should nevertheless be used for clothing that does not require a kind of regular washing maintenance. Um, so I would love you to spend a little time to talk about, like wow. you said, your book seems to be mostly be focused on consumers and, and, uh, and, and keeping the things that we have. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that from the consumer side? So the book is a why to rather than a how to. It masquerades I love as that. a how I love to that. because it's, you know, it has all, it's called loved clothes last, how the joy of rewearing and repairing your clothes can be a revolutionary act. And of course, there's loads of, you know, I'm a designer. I've been in this space for years and years and years. I've been experimenting. I'm a creative soul. I love my clothes. I do all sorts of, look, see, I'm wearing my favorite jumper, actually, coincidentally, which I let break <laughs> because I prefer it broken than I do mended in the case of this particular one. But the truth is that for me in the book, unless you understand why we need to think of longevity, um, we won't make the changes that we need to make. And so the book contextualizes the fashion industry. There's a lot of history, a lot of what we were and what we are. There's no moment really in which the fashion industry was glorious. There are little pockets of dignity. But I mean, you know, we're talking, you know, from industrialization, cotton grown in, uh, you know, the American South by enslaved peoples and um, woven in sweatshops in Victorian London and then distributed around the globe, you know, cherry on the cake by sure. the East India Company. So, you know, tell me that that's an industry that was probably ethical and sustainable at its core. It sure. wasn't. And, um, and so the book tells you why. We need to change. And from the consumer's point of view, it tries to give that enthusiasm that makes it infectious so that others are going to want to follow you. Because ultimately, although I really underline that brands have an obligation to change, we have an opportunity to do so via our clothes. And for those who haven't thought about doing it, it's actually really rewarding. I... I I, I, I get so excited when you said it's it's 
it's I'm gonna I want to put this on a t-shirt. It's a why to book masquerading yeah. as a how to book. And I feel like Brian, <laughs> I feel it. like that's we're 107 or whatever episodes in. That's like the entire ethos of this thing we realized <laughs> is is, you know, again, people come and they say, What can I do? And uh, you know, so we've got this weekly newsletter, and it is the it is the the big science news you missed this week, you know, which could be actually something new or an update on one of these larger micro things that's happening. And we try to give you a little blip that you can understand it from very reputable journalistic source. Um, and then we give you some analysis, sort of generalist analysis of why these things are happening and how. And then we give you these action steps about what you can do. And then the podcast is a really specific deep dive into one of those things. If you're like, oh, that's interesting, the microplastics thing, I'd like to know more about that from the newsletter. And so we'll do that or climb it or whatever. And 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 I've really come to think about it as this, it's, it's so much more compelling and easier and effective for people to take action if they understand the why of why they yeah. need to do it. You can't just say, press this button and donate to this place. You have to help them especially if it's something they're disconnected from, but almost even more so if it's something that's on their body or they're giving their children or their kids are breathing at school, for them to understand why they're fighting for this thing and why they need to take time out of their day or money out of their pocketbook to contribute to this thing or why they should hold on to this jumper that's got a hole in it. Because it's not just like the right thing to do. This is how it's affecting you and your families and your neighborhoods and also millions of people around the globe that we just casually ignore, especially white Americans all of the time. I mean, that's how we build our entire system on that. Like you said, there was no glory days of these, wow. of any of these industries. So I really love that you've, you've framed it that way. That's really so awesome. You know, I feel that, um, you know, when, when it comes to the, the reality that we are all in, we tend to take information the same way that we take fast fashion. You know, it's there quickly absorbed, gone. And really what is important is actually to take the time. So in the book, I, I also talk, talk about taking a different time when you're looking for clothes, you know, how we take quite a long time when we buy for clothes, you know, we check the size yeah. and with the color, is it the perfect yellow and, you know, compare with another brand, is it cheaper, longer, skinny, but low waist, high rise. So <laughs> we need to start making, creating a different criteria when you buy, you know, so you buy for your size, but also you buy to fit your principles. So... You also want to know if it's the right shape, but is the person who makes it being paid a living wage? And, you know, what, what is this perfect yellow we're talking about? I mean, is it a little ochre and a little sunshine? No, it just has to make sure that it doesn't contain azo dyes because that's infinitely more important to know at the end of the day. So it, it's, that is a, a very important element. People who will want to learn um, how to mend, you know, the, the, the internet is alive with the sound of knitting and crocheting. And, you know, there's communities have been born um, and, and reborn and it, it's, it's, it's losing its kind of female, um, you know, uh, identification and, and becoming a really hmm. a phenomenon. But what is also important to understand is that sustainability is not about what we buy. And we also need to advocate because for as many people like me that can afford to have my jumper mended by somebody or that, uh, you know, can well do the job I do, but um, there are really millions who don't. And when we demonize fast fashion and we say so badly made, it doesn't even warrant keeping, that's the most dangerous narrative that we've peddled our own selves for the past 20 years. First of all, because... Well, what about the people who make it? You know, we're saying, oh, I feel for you, but, you know, you work really out. It's really appalling. Um, and what right. about the people who can only afford to buy cheap clothing? Are we telling them, well, for you, actually, you're free. So we're doing exactly the same that we were doing 50 years ago with clothes that were mended. We've just swapped stigmas. And so for us, it's really important that people think of fast fashion as simply made and therefore simple to repair. And one of the things I've been saying relentlessly, so apologies if anybody has heard me before, you're going to hear this again. But, you know, <laughs> it's, the onus is on brands. You're a fast fashion brand. You're a supermarket. You want to make clothes that don't pay people, don't pay nature. Until you change that system, you have to make repairs available, affordable repairs in your store. You know, slowing down would ultimately improve the life of the garment workers. Garment workers are paid by the piece, not by the hour. So if we are all collectively demanding better as opposed to more, this will have a positive 
impact in the working conditions of the people who make those clothes, who will have more time to make, who will learn skills as they are making, who potentially after 30 years in a factory could open their own business in their own community, repairing other people or making, you know, children's clothing, you know, but sure. we're, we're not giving any of those opportunities to the the, the workers in, in the fashion supply chain. And we're not giving any of the opportunities to live sustainably to the people in our own communities who can't afford, you know, if you, if you can't bring food to the table, going plastic free shopping is really not going to be your priority. It's up to the supermarket to make that plastic free yeah. product available for you. So th these are things that we need to consider. And you said at the very beginning of this podcast that these things are difficult. I would say that they're complex, not difficult. It's very easy to understand. This industry has been exploiting people and nature for 300 years. Sure. Our own system no longer works. These things are easy. Yes, for 20 years, we've been besieged with denials and denialists, but now it's coming out. There is so much information out there. There are so many brilliant people willing to tell you a different story from the ones that you've already heard of to the millions that you haven't. And, you know, this is also in terms of fashion on our high streets, availability difference, inclusivity. Sure. That is awesome. I, I, I do. Sorry, love... I've been on, I, I went on a run. Oh, Forgive no, me. I'm just taking it all in. I, I, I just feel like I just, you know, I, it's like the matrix. I want it plugged in the back of my head. Thank you. This is, um, yeah. I love the idea. It's complex. It's not difficult. Yeah, that's very well said. I would imagine, Ursula, that despite all of uh, your efforts and uh, uh, your whole movement, this whole movement, um, your history uh, in the industry, that, uh, you're you're getting some some pushback, yeah. Could you tell us what the biggest obstacles are um, that that you run into, and maybe how it's different um, from brands to consumers? I don't think we have necessarily encountered pushbacks ourselves as an organization. We've seen a lot of change. Uh, we know it's not enough. We keep saying it. We uh, decided to take a different stand when we were formed. We're not doom and gloom. We are, after all, the majority of us fashion professionals, or people who have decided to work in this industry, but in our own terms. So we do come from a point of love, understanding, appreciation above all. The, the fashion revolution theory of change, so the top of the top, is for us an industry that conserves and restores the environment and values people over profit and growth. But we also say, we call ourselves a pro-fashion campaign. One of our initiatives, which is Fashion Open Studio, is all about showcasing the amazing innovation talent of young designers from literally all over the world. Tiny, tiny, really incredibly innovative people. And so, you know, we, we kind of, we, um, in a way, we challenge the mainstream and we champion the radicals. We've been well loved as, as an organization. And we've chosen not to speak sensationalistically, but to value accuracy more. The pushbacks that we see are in the fact that the industry is not changing enough, that it's not becoming easier to access the right amount of information, that there is still an incredible amount of greenwashing going on. And so organizations such as us, but there are plenty of other brilliant organizations that are pushing for um, educating, you know, uh, citizens on all sorts of aspects of how this industry has exploited from, uh, you know, an organization in the U.S. called the Slow Factory and the way that they're, they're providing free online education talking about um, cultural appropriation and racism and colonialism. Aja Barber, another brilliant speaker. And then another great organization we make uh, for, you know, the, the Pay Up campaign. Mm -hmm. So we, we've, you know, I feel that the, the pushback is that despite so much information out there, so many organizations, mainstream fashion industry is so gigantic sure that it takes a big time for them to actually really concretely change which is why it's really important to change proportions and really value the small 
not something that you can upscale, but things that you can replicate instead. I love that. And, and I do think, I mean, again, with any systemic issue, you can't ch turn the page overnight. You know, there's going to be uh, any number of factors involved. So so I appreciate that these these folks, you know, they're not just making these things in-house and spitting them out. It's very complicated. It doesn't mean they shouldn't have to do the right thing. But I do want to talk about sort of both the carrots and the sticks to make that happen. Um, in the U.S., uh, I think it was last year, the year before, the first time it was introduced, the Break Free from Plastic Act, I believe, and it may have been modified by now, it would ban uh, some single-use plastics. Uh, I think it would pause permits for new facilities uh, and actually require corporations to play, pay for recycling programs. And I think there's some environmental justice stuff in, in there as well, including a ban on shipping our waste too many of those countries, um, and for some domestic hearings for um, what they call fence line <laughs> communities like Cancer Alley. Um, do you have any examples of countries that are actually leading the way on things like this or incentives or, or regulations that have worked to move this progress a little bit faster on the brand side? I would be the wrong person to talk about this. Uh, you'd need either Carrie or, or Sarah from the policy team. So I okay, do great. have information, but I haven't prepared it. And so I oh, no, no, no. You I know, mean, I'm you, not ready to I, you don't have to half, go through bills. <laughs> half bits and half pieces. Uh, totally. No, n totally makes sense. Do you, let me ask you this. Do you feel like uh, that there has been progress made that places are actually starting to embrace these things and that there are, you see governments, whether local or national, starting to go after them? Little. I mean, uh, the, the reality is that, well, obviously plastic is really not, you know, plastic in the sense that plastic is for us linked with polyester. Sure. And so it's not the overall of, of what we do. So different incentives in different countries in order to ameliorate the fashion supply chain coming from the governments. I mean, there are small pockets of, um, you know, initiatives. Um, certainly in the EU, we're beginning to see more and more um, interest in, in applying legislation, due diligence legislation. There's a due diligence legislation in France. There's a new law um, in the EU that was just been, you know, it's been voted uh, again, I, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't prepared, so I know oh, the God. name somewhere. No, no worries. But I mean, it's the due diligence, um, human rights, something you can Google it. Perfect. Um, so yeah. we're beginning to see, uh, you know, the, the necessity to operate differently. But I think it's very, very early days okay, in that, terms of systemic change. That That's super helpful for us to know, you know, as to re for people to really grasp and understand like, oh, there's a lot of work to still be done here. It's not like governments are going, oh, we got to fix this. That's, no, it, it's it's not. The right. entire system is rotten to the core. Um, it relies on self, uh, you know, audits are self-declared. Um, it, it's, you know, rampantly tra untransparent. So it's it's really a system that needs to kind of start from a pretty good stretch. I mean, you know, we do know that the CEOs of tomorrow, uh, you know, the kids that I teach in schools, for instance, in the top fashion schools sure. or the ones that are coming, you know, we know the people that inhabit brands really do genuinely want to change. But ultimately, the system needs to change <laughs> altogether sure. before, yeah. you know, before the fashion industry can really make these gigantic changes. It makes sense. Um, yeah. That's a perfect segue into uh, our action steps, oh, yeah. Brian, if you want to tackle that. Yeah, I definitely want to make sure we we, we get to this before uh, before we have to let you go. Um, so yeah, so like always, let's get into our action steps here. What what all of our listeners can do to uh, to help support you? Um, uh, and let's start with uh, uh, their 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 voice. We always like to 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 mention what what can everybody do with their voice and and their dollar. You know, so um, uh, what what are like the big what are big actionable uh, questions that we can be asking? Any of our listeners can be asking of of uh, their representatives uh, uh, to 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 help support you and and your and your mission. First of all, uh, find out uh, your local fashion revolution team. In the sense that in the USA, for instance, we have several regional teams. But wherever you are in the world, listening to this newsletter, there's 92 people, 92 teams around the world, and they are specialized in letting you know 
how you can act locally. I wouldn't have the first clue as to how to activate somebody, um, you know, on the other side of the planet sure. and what is important for their community at this point in time in terms of the fashion industry. I can talk generically about the topics, you know, sure. this Fashion Revolution right. Week, for instance, is called Rights, Relationships and Revolution. And it's about human rights and the rights of nature. But then every one of our teams will be able to connect that with small actions that you can take, how to approach your local communities. There's loads of get involved facts that tell you exactly that, how to take part as a person, as a brand, as a school, as a, as a group. So that would be my first port of call. My second would be, again, starting from your gut feeling, because some of us are interested in supply chain workers and others, it's about animal welfare. Sure. But do find your campaign. Do find where you want your voice to count. Um, so, you know, we've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, human rights and the rights of workers. So then I will send you back to the pay up campaign, uh, which is really focusing on ensuring that profits are better shared. They've just launched another hashtag, pay, uh, share your profits, um, if that's your, your sphere. Or go with the who made my clothes and see where that takes you um, or the what's in my clothes. But follow what you know, where you know that you want to be heard. I love that. And, and of course, yeah, yeah the, the local teams, it seems these these are such, obviously it's a global systemic issue, but the local places you can have impact makes makes such a difference as opposed to, like you said, you dictating it from afar. You can provide the guidelines and, and the passion behind exactly. it. Exactly. And Fashion Revolution USA partners and speaks with all of the organizations that I mentioned from Slow Factory to Pay Up to, you know, and, and will give you loads of information and loads of points of contact. It's getting really quite regional. That's fantastic. And just to clarify, when is uh, the week this year? So so we're ahead of it here. From the 19th until the 25th of April. Perfect. This is perfect. And if you're time. awake okay. at 1.30, at 1 p.m. 1, 1 1 on, um, that's 1 p.m. CET, UK time. That's our kickoff event, which is called Fashion Question Time. Okay. And it's in partnership with the v and Museum. And it's, you will learn a lot. We have the most incredible speakers. Awesome. We will definitely get involved. Cool. That's incredible. Um, uh, okay, so and let's talk about where where we can uh, spend our money. Yeah, like obviously everybody needs uh, clothes. Yes, uh, fewer, uh, better made clothes, but clothes. Uh, where can everybody go uh, to that? You know, to to, to to track brands and find good places uh, to to buy from if they do need new stuff. Well, I would always advocate trying to buy secondhand first or, you know, sure. borrow, uh, you know, from, from friends. But obviously this is not possible, for instance, when you have, you know, young children, not necessarily, but there are more and more online places where, you know, at the touch of a, again, a search engine, you will find reputable um, resellers or sellers that either sell secondhand um, that, that you can, you know, really mix and match. It's, it's huge. It's the, the secondhand market is growing 10 times faster than, um, fast fashion. And these brands are coming out fast and furiously, and they want you to know that they're there. So they're really <laughs> easy to find. And online obviously has made this type of, um, distribution, uh, and this type of, you know, uh, shopping really possible. There is also something really brilliant about, if you can afford it, to support the young and emerging designers that are coming out right now. Um, the relationship between a designer and their customer can be profoundly intimate. And it doesn't necessarily have to be incredibly expensive because you start to get to know them. They will tell you every time that they've got a sample sale, they will keep the things that are the cheaper for you. And your opinion will matter to them. You will wear their clothes and you will say, you know what? Felt a bit uncomfortable over there. Sure. And that will reflect in the way that that designer designed. So it's it's a really fundamental relationship. And we've got opportunities to do it now because, you know, there are so many. Again, there are some pretty um, reputable uh, places where you can go and look for them. I would suggest, you know, if you're very, very into fashion, if you follow, for instance, Sara Maino, who is from Italia Vogue. She does uh, a wonderful talent scouting called um, Vogue Talents. 
And there's loads of amazing fashion there. Our own one, Fashion Open Studio, will put you in touch again with very small designers from all over the world. But again, on on Google, on social, on you know social media, it should be easy to find platforms online that sell ethical designers. And it's going to be easy to know because if the information is understandable, if you believe them and you can double check, um, if there's a link on those designers that tells you who made their clothes and what's contained in them, that's a pretty good starting point. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I love I love that answer of just like, if you want to know, like, just go look. It, it, like you said, it's not hard. If you're going to buy something, just go look, just go check it out first. But if you can't, and if you have to, buy cheap, because that's all that you can afford. Buy with exactly the same mentality as if you were buying a designer piece. So love it. Choose it. Wear it. Buy imagining it that it could look different on someone else or that if you actually pick the skirt up, it would, you know, change shape. Buy with the frame that you're going to keep it, because if you buy with the framework that you're going to keep it, then you're going to do all sorts of really interesting things, like looking inside the clothes to see if it's going to fall apart. You know, if there's a string, pull it. If it unravels, (laughs) don't buy it. Go to the next one. It won't. Buy that one. I love that. We have to love what we buy and keep what we buy, cheap or expensive. I love that. Um, Two last things, and then you're out of here. They'll be quick. One, I realized... Uh, I don't know if you've seen the trailer for it, but there's a new Disney movie coming out about Cruella DeVille, and it's about her origin story, and it's all 60s and 70s fashion. Uh, I will send you the link to the trailer. I think you'd love it. And also, my wife wrote the movie. Um, oh my God, so, even more. Send it to me yeah, straight away. I, will send I, mean, it to I, can't, I can't wait for virtual clothing. So when all of the clothes that Cruella DeVille is actually wearing now eventually will be available for me yeah. to buy and wear them. Yes. <laughs> And I, I can't give any secrets away about what it's about or what's included, but mm. but I think you'll really, really dig it based on what we've talked about. Great. La- last thing, stunning. quick question for you. We ask everybody, what's a book uh, you've read this year, uh, Ursula, that's opened your mind to a topic maybe you hadn't considered before or maybe has changed your thinking in, in some way? Okay, this is really, really difficult because I read an awful lot. So I, love it. Um, I go yeah. through books. Uh, so, um, do you mean within my work? Within my work, whatever it would be you would, probably whatever you would like. Okay, well then, no. If I can just pick one from this year, it would be um, Bernadine Evaristo, Girl, Woman, Other. Okay, awesome, perfect. We will dig that one up, and we've got a little. We've got a list on Bookshop yes. uh, where everybody can go check out our guest well, obviously recommendations. Also, I kind of quite like writing my book, and I and don't know your book. that meant that I no, read it. No, your <laughs> book is absolutely going in there. <laughs> I would hope you read it. There it is, beautiful, awesome. Yeah, that that is that. Amazing. Like. Um, Orsla, where can our listeners follow you online? Um, so <laughs> I am at Orsola de Castro, which is my full name on Instagram and Twitter. Okay. That's about it. And then, but again, you know, what wherever the you are, the fashion. The, the fashion revolution is at Fash Rev. But then each country has also their own handles. And sure. I really don't remember all of them. Oh, <laughs> don't worry. We'll put it on the show notes. We <laughs> got Generally, it. Shav, like USA, Italy, yeah. you know, Indonesia, uh, India at the bottom of, of some We've got Fash it. Rev of some sort. Brian, Brian that's right. what he does. He'll he'll track all of it down. Um, I'm Orsa, on. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for your time, for everything thank you're doing. You. This has been so enlightening. And and I'm, I'm excited about the whole thing. Thank you for your time. I'm so excited you're yeah. off to get your shot. This is wonderful news. What a good day. Uh, you're going to do Thank Great. you so much yes. for inviting me of and course. for being patient with my time. Oh, of course. Uh, we oh, will talk wonderful. to you so soon, okay? Take yeah. care. Great to meet you both, and thank you for your work. You're doing amazing, too. Oh, you're the greatest. Thanks to our incredible guest today, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. We hope this episode has made your commute or awesome workout or dishwashing or fucking dog walking late at night that much more pleasant. As a reminder, please subscribe to our free email newsletter at importantnotimportant.com. It is all the news most vital to our survival as a species. And you can follow us all over the internet. You can find us on Twitter at important, not imp. Uh, just it's so weird. Also on Facebook and Instagram at Important Not Important, Pinterest and Tumblr, the same thing. So check us out, follow us, share us, like us, you know the deal. And please subscribe to our show wherever you listen to things like this. And if you're really fucking awesome, 
rate us on Apple Podcasts. Keep the lights on. Thanks. Please. <laughs> and you can find the show notes from today right in your little podcast player and at our website, importantnotimportant.com. Thanks to the very awesome Tim Blaine for our jamming music, to all of you for listening, and finally, most importantly, to our moms for making us. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.